Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. Today's episode is sponsored by the University of Tennessee at Martin. UT Martin offers more than 100 academic areas of study within 18 undergraduate degree programs. Contact UT Martin today to find a program that's right for you. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast recorded here every single week here in beautiful West Tennessee. Our podcast, just like our museum and heritage park, is dedicated to celebrating our unique Southern culture, spirit, and accomplishments. I'm Scott Williams, and my special guest today is Melanie Hollis, and we're going to talk all about theater at both the University of Tennessee at Martin and at the Masquerade Theater. Um, So are you from, like, are you originally from around here? I am from Union City. Oh, wow. Okay. Born and bred. Afraid so. I mean, yes, I am. What what part of, um, were you out in the country? Were you in the city? No, in the city. My my parents were um, involved in school. My mother was a librarian. She ended up at UTM. My daddy was the art teacher and the biology teacher at OC. And then got hired on at UTM as the well, that's art teacher. So you grew up around the arts. I did. You have brothers and sisters? I have a younger brother and an older sister. And did they pick up the arts as you did? My older sister is um, a musical prodigy. Wow. And an artist. And how does she use that musical prodigyness? She played the organ at church. Oh, okay, nice. That was her that was her venue. Okay. And so and she's musical and you're theatrical. I sort of, I guess. <laughs> I'm kind of in the middle. I feel okay. like she got it all. You know, the older sibling is the one that 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 gets everything. You know, they're the people pleaser. Everyone loves them. They're the firstborn. And then there I come along. So you were in the middle. I am the middle child. Okay, gotcha. But you know what's interesting? If I look at any production I'm doing... The majority of people on that stage are middle children. Oh, that's interesting. Wonder why that is. I don't know because we're odd. Yeah, you know the 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 third child is usually the one that sort of raises themselves. You know, like somebody said that uh, I heard somebody say the other day that the like for the old for the firstborn, the parents are cooking all the food and they're trying. You know, by the time the third comes along, you know, they're pulling the stool up to the well, stove and unless they're a different gender. Okay. Because okay. my brother, he's the only male, and oh, he was that longed okay. for male wow. heir. Yeah. And so my <laughs> sister's, my sister has a full baby book. My brother has a full baby book, and I'm like, eh, you know, little pieces here oh, and there. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, he was kind of the firstborn of, you know, he was like the prince arrived. And you know, I have two daughters and one son. Oh, what's what's their birth order? Uh, girl, girl, boy. Oh, exactly the that's same. Interesting. Isn't that odd? Yeah, that's very strange. Um, did you make uh, special efforts? I did not. My sister-in-law, on the other hand, carried around something to ensure a a birth of a boy, <laughs> like a lucky charm. <laughs> yes, can, can, does that I, work? I just I hoped know. for the best. Yeah, we had two girls. Well, she had one of each. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I have always kind of wanted a boy. And when we go in a restaurant or whatever, and you know, I'm ushering the whole family in, I always feel like there's one missing. So Because there's no boy. There's no boy, they yeah. They're so much easier. Yeah, that's what I've heard. But we're done now, so oh, I'm okay. counting. Well, on a, I'm counting on a grandchild now, okay. eventually. Okay. But so, so you guys, so your did did your brother pursue any kind of art? You know, he has talent, but I mean, you know him, and sure. he can mimic any character, any voice. I'm so jealous mm-hmm. of that I cannot do. Well, and he he portrays um, uh, what's the character, Katie? That that uh, her brother d- doesn't he? Pr- He's the conductor for the polar. Express. The conductor for Polar Express. Now so, I don't I don't know if he does Tom Hanks voices or whatever he does, but he can hear a voice and re- repeat it. I think he embodies the, his own version of the character. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah. but he does a great job, and I didn't realize he was your brother. So, and he has lots of artistic talent. He just doesn't really use it. Yeah, um, like we do. Has he been in any of the plays at the Masquerade? Mm, I think he was in Best Christmas Pageant Ever once. Okay, as in a, as the minister or something. Yeah. Well, I, they need to recruit him, and you know, Katie's on the board, so maybe she, she'll... he was on the board. Okay. 
He's not. He's anymore. just busy. He's a busy. He's got a lot going on. He quit. Yeah, I understand. So you, <laughs> he's busy. So you grew up here. You went to school here, and then where did you go to well, college? Well, I I kind of flitted around. I went to Union for a year and a half. Right. Got up one day in French class and said, "I'm going home." I never <laughs> came back. I'd never stepped foot on a on a stage until I was 20 years old. My mother took me to an audition at mm-hmm. UTM, and you know I didn't want to go there because they were there. You, Try to right. get away from your parents, but yep. I ended up there, and then I went to the University of Kansas Oh, for my master's in theater. That was kind of a um, jump. What? Yes. What What led you there? A boy. Oh. To get to leave. I was sure. leaving someone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that was motivation, at least. So, I mean, I went, I'd, I'd never been there, went sight unseen, didn't know anybody. Wow. Boom. That's interesting. It's one of the best decisions I ever made. Yeah. Now, what what um, did you discover once you arrived? Uh, I like Kansas. Kansas is a wonderful part of town uh, of the country, and I have met a lot of people who are doing lots of interesting things. I mean, I know somebody on TV. The world of theater and the arts is kind of small mm-hmm. in that regard, but I made a lot of connections with people. I uh, hooked up with some people in Texas, so I went down to uh, Abilene and did summer stock for a few years. I ended up in Memphis for a while doing different kinds of theater things, Um, just kind of piddled around until I ended up back here. And so you were more performing, teaching? Performing. So performing is what you really loved. At that point in time. And so you did you have a, uh, I mean, people in the arts typically don't have super long-term you know, plans, but were you envisioning yourself going to Hollywood or New York? No, no, I really just kind of wanted to be regional theater Mm -hmm. because um, I've had too many friends that went to New York and did not make it, you know, and it's it's a hard, it's a hard thing to try to do. Statistically, it's near about impossible. Yes, it is. I mean, you have to be that one shining light in the darkness. And I knew I was not. I mean, I had some talent. I was adequate, but... And what kind of uh, performances did you Uh, do? Everything, uh, yeah. I'm not yeah. a theater person, so I don't. I, I go to the theater, but I even did lots of musicals. Oh, okay, nice. So I mean, I just did whatever, and yeah. I sewed. Oh, so that's people, you know, sometimes are looking for dual threats. You know, you can build a set and do the lead. Mm-hmm. So I could make costumes. In and... what brought you back? What you know, like you're out running around. It sounds like you're having fun. And, and Oh, I don't know. I think it's, you you get to a point in your life and you go, man, this is boring. Let's do something else. Or I'm tired of this. I mean, I came back here when I was 33. Okay. So I had been out and about and marriage and three children happened. So. And did you uh, envision yourself coming here and getting involved in the theater here? Did you know there would be a theater community? Well... Uh, yeah, I did, but, um, Northwest Tennessee struggles culturally, you know, this Mm -hmm. probably from, from coming in here. So there's not a whole lot of outlets. So I was very, um, leery of that aspect, but I was busy raising kids. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. So and so you really weren't necessarily at that moment when you've got all those kids like thinking about where you're going to where's your next act. That's gig. exactly right. And by the time I wanted to get back to the theater as we age, we forget things mm-hmm. sometimes. So my my grasp on holding lines in my head mm-hmm. kind of lessened a little bit. So mm-hmm. my desire to be on stage has been replaced by my desire to put the play on. Yeah, and so how, what was the first uh, getting back involved in when after you moved here? What was the next thing you did in the theater community here? I think probably I helped Saki Doss with the Wizard of Oz. Okay, and that was mm, my oldest is twenty eight, and she had not been born. Okay, so that was a while ago. That was a while. Saki back. actually taught my daughter ballet in memphis so she so yeah so we um yeah so i know i knew her long before i moved here saki's taught everyone (laughs) everywhere (laughs) so so you started getting back involved how long before you ended up at ut martin uh well my friend uh doug cook who was the the designer and the chair department chair um contacted me I don't know, Carly was just born, to come over and um, sew 
for some shows. So I went in um, in that on that level that I was the costumer for the shows, and then eventually um, he wanted me to come in and adjunct. So I did that for a while, and then I rose into the position I'm at right now. And which is which is well, it's kind of a jack of all trades over there. Um, I'm the costumer for all the productions. I teach costume and makeup. I teach acting, and I teach intro to theater as well as theater history. Now I would say that that is possibly a, a you tell me if that's a benefit or not of working in a smaller. Uh, community because you get to do a whole lot of things. Well, but but my I, I, this is going to sound like I'm bragging or something, but you could not replace me with one person over there, right? Because of the the variety of things that I am able to do. And how long have you been there now? Twelve years. Okay. Okay. And you you probably do you find yourself. So UT Martin has a lot of re, you know regional students coming in from right, a lot right. from rural communities. Do you find yourself introducing theater to a lot of these? Oh, folks? indeed, I teach two one uh, two one ten classes, which is a theater appreciation. So I have fifty students in each class, and and the majority of students have never seen a play. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? We we take it for granted when you grow up in a like I grew up in Memphis, and so. Going to the theater oh, is, theaters is, everywhere. is part of, you know, going to the um, playhouse on the square and, you know, it's part of your education. So do what about like high school around here? Are there are there high school theater groups? There are. And I think, uh, you know, they're coming along. Mm-hmm. They're not great. Yeah. But they're coming. And we try to do masquerade. We try to do a fall show. We didn't this year. In the past, have a, a, a show in all... October maybe, where we allow schools to come in and see the show for free. Mm. Oh, that's good. Last year we did yeah. Charlotte's Web, and I had enough kids audition that I had double cast it. Oh, okay, that's great. And then we had two Friday performances and let all the elementary, middle school, whoever wanted to come, come in to see the show for free. And you know, we here at Discovery Park have the Historic Theater Academy mm-hmm. where kids can come. Which in is a great and, idea. Yeah, and and I was talking to one girl, and she said she didn't really feel like she was alive until she got here and started getting to do that. Because you know, if you're living in a rural community and you're not great at sports, then oftentimes I think there isn't a place for you to be able to find an outlet to find. Yeah, your we see that all and, the time. You know, so I wonder what could be done. I know. Are you familiar with Arts Can? I know the folks in Martin are working on arts weekly weekly arts can is what it's called. I do know about it. Yeah, I know that they're working towards that. It'd be great if we had more more arts here in this community. But one thing my wife and I have both, you know, coming from outside and coming here, we've both noticed that everywhere we go, everybody we talk to, people usually have a side gig of some kind that is creative. Mm-hmm. You know, the, you know, people are doing one thing, but they're also uh, a play. Have a play they're working on, or they're working on a book, or they're a singer, or you know. So we do see a lot of that. A lot of that here. What uh, kind of performances do you guys do at UT Martin? I haven't gotten to see any of them. Uh, yet. We just closed a musical called the 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. Okay, I saw that on Facebook. Uh, that is, uh, uh, it's it won a lot of awards. It, it didn't run for a, a great amount of time on Broadway, but it's a group of middle schoolers who come together to try to win a spelling bee, and they each have their little idiosyncrasies, and it's a comedy and. It was it, it was attended very well. Oh, good. So uh, my next question was going to be: Do you consider it a success? Did you have, you know, did you sell are, tickets? Yeah, we are struggling now. That that show was in conjunction with the music department, so we had a live band. We mm. had the the uh, vocal teachers worked with the cast, um, so it, it was a collaborative effort. So maybe that brought in more students to yeah. see the oh, show. Oh, that's good. That's good. How many do you have every year, I'm assuming, that you have theater? You have a whole, like a, a new theater, I think. This was Yes, this opened our new big Harriet Fulton Theater, which seats 340. Oh, that's nice. And then we also have a smaller venue, our Black Box, which seats about 80. Okay, and I've been there before. And then, I, you know, there's a, there's one... There's one student to you. I'm sure you would. Know, I don't know his name, but he played. He played. He played the donkey in Hunter Shrek. Burton. Yeah, I saw him when I was at UT Martin at up for a meeting, and he walked down the hall. And for a split <laughs> second, I thought it was like a celebrity. I was like, 
you know, oh, it's that's Hunter. someone famous. It's Hunter. <laughs> you know, so anyway, yeah, he's really talented. He is really talented. I brought, I used him in a Junie B. Jones, the very first Junie B. Jones musical we did. Uh-huh. He was Mr. Scary. So he was forever <laughs> known as Mr. Scary. And then he became Donkey. And now he's Donkey. Yeah, no, he definitely, he owned that role, as they say. He is a great kid, and he's going to go, you're going to see him. Yeah. Do you, do you have students that, like, you have and you think... This Very rarely, got yeah. But he is a—he's a gem. He's—he's he's one that I think will be highly successful as yeah. a performer. And so, if if I'm in your class and you're seeing something, you're seeing that sparkle in me. Where are you going to send me? Are you going to suggest that I go to New York, or what's what's your advice for me? Uh well, with Hunter. Um, he he needs to go to start auditioning these regional auditions, mm-hmm. so he can be seen with all these different companies, and they have them every year in different parts of the country that you go in and audition, and then if they they like you, they offer you jobs. Yeah, I think the are are there many people from around here that have made it? No, um, I know um, in Paris. Uh, Sherry Jones Jones is uh, from Paris, Tennessee. Yes, she is, which is nice. So it'd be nice if we can cook up a superstar. It would be great. <laughs> and I could say, oh, I knew him. That's right. That's right. We could all benefit. Yes. Yeah. We could have him him or her come here to Discovery Park. That would be great, wouldn't yeah. it? Yes. So uh, what what's coming up? What are the next plays you're working on? Well, in Masquerade, mm-hmm. well, I can't say because we haven't procured rights, but sure. it's it's some child story that is about a giant fruit. <laughs> oh, I love. Well, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, but if I did, I love that that story. Yeah, we have gone all That's the great. way around the world. We've talked about so many different shows, yeah. and and I read uh, read the script a couple of days ago, and have seen some clips, and that was the. This is the show that's piqued my interest. Are the are the songs that are um, in that show the same as in the movie? That I don't know. Yeah. I know it's Randy Newman who yeah, wrote yeah. Toy Story. Mm-hmm. Um, that, yeah, that kind of. I, I don't tend to listen to the music. I just read the words. Yeah, because yeah. I don't. I, I'm not bothered with that. Now, now, so with the theater here, what what is your? Do you produce some of the shows, all the shows? I'm the director. So you direct. So you direct the whole thing. And the design, the costumer. So you're the right person for me to pitch um, getting. Um, yeah, Little Shop of Horrors. That's what I... Scott. Yeah. Yeah, right, I, I want I'll Little Shop. I'll tell you my, my experience with Little Shop. We yeah. did it a few years ago at UTM. Mm-hmm. And it's a big show. And you we had to rent the flowers. Okay. It was $2,000. For the... Just for, the, for that. So I'd have to underwrite the plant. Yes. And then would. and only then would you consider... And you had to have a, a, a hefty man yeah. inside... Maneuvering that plant around. Yeah, so we could get Luke to do that. Would you do that, Luke? Would you be the plant? We had an ex marine. <laughs> <laughs> um, that'd probably be exhausting. Luke's it's a too cute. Busy. I mean, it's a cute show, but it is a pricey show. Yeah. Well, I loved Shrek. Thank um, you. My whole family, we came and uh, watched Shrek. We were blown away by how good it was. I mean, it was fantastic. Thank you. Thank so, yeah, bravo. And then at UT Martin, anything coming up? Um, probably not a show that no anyone's going to know, and I have to be honest, I didn't really know it. It's called God of Carnage. Mm-hmm. It is a more serious four-person play. Yeah. And we'll do that in the spring. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you for all the work that you're doing to bring arts to the community. Thank you. I think it's super important and really meets a need that's going to continue to grow. I agree. And thank you for being on our podcast. Certainly. And now Andrew Gibson is taking us behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America to see what we may be able to discover today. Thank you, Scott. I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at beautiful Discovery Park of America. And today I am with Zach Gray, uh, our in-house historian, who will be sharing with us a story about one of our artifacts we have on display here uh, in our beautiful 1800 settlement. Um, which is located on our north side of the park. Uh, So, Zach, take it away. Tell us about what artifact we're talking about. Well, the artifact in particular that I'm talking about, or will be talking about, is our covered wagon that we have out in our settlement. It's over by the the barn, where you can go see the tool shed and other other artifacts over there. Um, The covered wagon, especially during that time period, which would be in the 18... 
uh, around the 1830s to 1870s was used primarily to get a person from one place to the other, um, particularly if you want to talk about it with the Oregon Trail. People use these wagons to transport their entire lives to a new home. Um, a lot of times they would use the two popular kinds of wagons were the uh, the consto- the let me get it right the Constoga ca- uh, wagon and then also the Prairie scr- Schooner. The Prairie Schooner was called that because it actually looked people said it looked like a boat, a sailboat with its white um, cover. These wagons could carry quite a bit. The tra- the travel going over there was very um, treacherous. They could um, die very easily, and a lot of people did die from this trip. So they had to take a lot of their different supplies, um, particularly food, ammunition, weapons, and you know whatever else you wanted to take, like your bed and other things. Typically, these wagons could carry around uh, a little over 2,000 pounds. You would typically carry around 200 pounds of flour, to make, you know, biscuits, hardtack, other things like that. You'd take sugar, bacon, coffee, salt, and then other things. These wagons were stacked full of your life. Um, And that also meant no room for you to sit. It was pulled by either ox or um, horses, and you'd be walking beside your wagon the entire time. Uh, these people walked all the way from, if you're talking about the Oregon Trail, they walked from the Independence, Missouri, all the way over to Oregon, which, like I said before, was a over 2000 mile journey. They would only go 15 miles a day. So this was a four to six month journey. So you could not plan this halfway. You had to make sure you took the time to plan this out correctly because let's say you didn't have enough food. Well, you're going to starve. Or let's say you actually packed too much. Well, your animals might end up suffering from overweighted carts. Or when you had to cross a river, you have to take off. The, sometimes they took off the wheels, put them onto ferries and took them across or waded across in the water. So if they're too heavy, they could sink. There goes all your livelihood. Um, And typically, with these wagons, they would be in what they would call wagon trains. Uh, A typical wagon train was around 30 wagons or less, but there are some of upwards of 200 wagons in a singular wagon train. So it's really they took so many wagons because it was a um, greater number could keep you safe, Um, whether that be from animals um, Native Americans who would attack them. Not all of them did, but there were some tribes that did attack the settlers going west. Um, but with these wagons, another issue was you have all your livelihood in this one wagon. Well, you're also condensed in the way you're surviving around a lot of people. And one of the biggest killers going across was not the environment, but it was disease. And also uh, the second biggest one was a uh, uh, gun accidents. But so you better hope, uh, better hope you uh, can make it all the way there and you're very healthy. So now, you, you keep saying there uh, in a lot of these situations, where was there? There was typically Oregon city. Um, they would go all the way out West um, all the way to the other side of the country they went some to California, some to Oregon, some even to um, um, New Mexico when Mexico seceded Texas and the other states down there um, to the United States. It was basically people having the having the opportunity to make a better life for their family. Um, these people did not take it very lightly in the way that they packed up their entire livelihood, sold their houses, sold whatever they couldn't put on this cart. Because like I said, this cart only fit around 2,500 pounds. So that means if you can't take, sorry, grandmother's 
family heirloom, you might not be you might have to, might have to leave it behind or sell it to be able to pay for the animals. And the one thing I forgot to mention, not only did they have all their livelihood as in their material goods, they had to take their animals with them. So we're looking at there are some estimates of 200 or more cattle and over like in the thousands of sheep and other animals going along with them while they're making this track or this trek. So they can, you're talking about, it'd be an amazing sight to see this enormous wagon train with all of these animals going along the way, going west. And like I said, going towards like the Oregon Trail ended up leaving Oregon City at the time. And then they would go off from there. Zach, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, thank you all for listening to today's episode uh, of Real Foot Forward, a West Nessie podcast. We hope to see you here at beautiful Discovery Park of America real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.